the many forms of communism, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our lecture on the diverse forms of communism and capitalism, a journey through the intricate tapestry of economic and social structures. In our previous chapter, we delved into a basic form of communism, characterized by a combination of communist class structures and familiar non-class processes, such as collectivized property and state plan distribution. Today, we venture further, exploring the less familiar terrains of communism, where communist class structures coexist with elements typically associated with capitalism, private ownership of means of production, undemocratic power distributions, and competitive markets. Our exploration does not stop there. In Chapter 3, we will pivot to examine the various forms of capitalism, revealing how capitalist class structures can intriguingly coexist and interact with collectivized property, state planning, and even democratic political institutions. This exploration underscores the fluidity and diversity within these economic systems, challenging traditional binaries and simplistic definitions. Central to our discussion is the concept of class structure, particularly the distinction between communism and capitalism, based on surplus production and appropriation. In all forms of communism, a collective of surplus producers also appropriates and distributes the surplus, setting it apart from any form of capitalism where surplus appropriation and distribution are carried out by different entities from the producers. This surplus-based demarcation offers a fresh perspective, distinct from traditional views that focus on property distribution, resource and product distribution mechanisms, and power structures. Our journey also critically examines the historical and theoretical debates surrounding these concepts, especially in the context of the USSR. We will delve into how the absence of a surplus labor approach, as initiated by Marx, influenced the trajectory of socialist and communist regimes. The dissatisfaction and alienation under regimes of collective property and planning, and the subsequent shifts back to private property and markets, highlight the complexities and ironies of these economic transformations. As we navigate through these diverse forms of communism and capitalism, we invite you to consider alternative perspectives and solutions to the challenges posed by exploitative class structures, both in historical contexts and in contemporary global scenarios. This lecture aims not just to inform, but to provoke thought and debate about the possibilities and limitations of these economic systems in shaping our world. Part 1, Class and Property Good Morning Students. Today, we delve into a thought-provoking aspect of economic theory, examining the interplay between communism and private property, as discussed in our previous chapter. This exploration challenges conventional Marxian and non-Marxian perspectives, which often view communism and private property as mutually exclusive. Let's consider a scenario where collective ownership in a communist system gives way to private ownership of the means of production. Traditional theories might view this shift as a definitive transition from communism to capitalism. However, our analysis suggests a more nuanced understanding. We argue that a change in property ownership does not necessarily dictate a uniform effect on class structures or other societal aspects. The broader context of each historical case significantly influences the outcomes of such changes. Imagine a form of communism where private property coexists with and even supports a communist class structure. In this scenario, private property owners could invest in enterprises with communist class structures, receiving dividends from the surpluses generated. This arrangement challenges the traditional dichotomy of communism and capitalism, suggesting a hybrid form we might term private property communism. Consider the implications of this model. Private owners investing in communist enterprises could receive dividends, similar to capitalist enterprises. Yet the workers in these enterprises, despite the private ownership of means of production, could still collectively produce appropriate and distribute their surpluses. This arrangement does not inherently lead to a labor market typical of capitalist systems. Workers could be guaranteed employment and allocated to enterprises by state officials, regardless of whether the means of production are privately or collectively owned. This model also raises questions about the distribution of surpluses and the potential for inequalities. For instance, the dividends paid to private owners could lead to unequal income distributions. Moreover, 
the involvement of private property in a communist structure could introduce unique strains and tensions, such as jealousy and resentment over changing distributions of property. Laws might be enacted to mitigate these tensions, such as mandating rotation through different class positions or limiting property inequality through taxation. Our discussion also extends to the potential contradictions and dynamics within this form of communism. For example, if private owners demand and receive larger shares of the surpluses, it could strain the system, possibly leading to insufficient surplus for other necessary allocations. This tension could spark struggles over the distribution of surpluses and potentially threaten the survival of communist class structures. Furthermore, we explore variations within this model, such as decentralized communist class structures where workers own and manage their enterprises. This arrangement could lead to different levels of surplus production and distribution, potentially creating inequalities and conflicts similar to those in our first example. In conclusion, our exploration today reveals the complex and often contradictory relationship between class structures and property regimes. We see that communist class structures can coexist with a range of property regimes, from collective to private, and that these interactions are deeply influenced by the broader social context. As we continue our journey through the many forms of communism, let's keep in mind the dynamic and evolving nature of these economic systems and the myriad possibilities they present. Part 2 Class and Markets In this monologue, I aim to delve into the intricate relationship between class structures, particularly communist class structures, and markets, and how they coexist, interact, and sometimes conflict within a societal framework. Let's imagine a society where two primary enterprises exist, one producing cloth and the other food. Both operate under communist class structures, but within a market system that involves exchanges between buyers and sellers. Here, workers collectively produce and sell their outputs. A portion of their sales revenue is derived from their necessary labor which the collective uses to pay individual wages. The surplus labor generates additional revenue, which is also collectively appropriated and distributed. This scenario presents a unique blend of communist labor and commodities intertwined with market dynamics. These commodities and the terms associated with them like value, surplus value, price, and profit should be distinctly labeled as communist, to reflect their origin in communist class structures. This distinction is crucial, as Marx pointed out, to understand the difference between commodities emerging from capitalist and non-capitalist structures. Now, let's consider the labor market. Contrary to popular belief, a market in labor power does not exclusively signify capitalism. In our context, Laborers sell their labor power through mutual agreements or contracts, using the wages earned to buy necessities, which are also commodities. This scenario presumes a generalized market system for distributing resources and products. In such a system, two fundamental questions arise. Who inside the producing enterprises produces, appropriates, and distributes the surplus? And to whom and for what purposes are shares of the surplus distributed. If we find a communist class structure within all enterprises, it implies that the collective of communist workers is both the purchaser of labor power and the seller of its products. The collective buys labor power from its members, combines it with other means of production, and then sells the output in the market, using part of the revenue for wages and the rest for collective appropriation and distribution. This form of communism, where communist class structures coexist with markets, can be termed market communism. However, this blend of market communism isn't without its complexities and contradictions. For instance, it might necessitate new laws and a shift in social consciousness. Laws might require laborers selling their labor power to communist enterprises to become part of the collective that appropriates and distributes surplus labor. A new social consciousness might normalize the dual role of workers as both individual sellers and collective buyers of their labor power. A state coexisting with such a market system and communist class structures would likely play a pivotal role in securing these laws and social consciousness. Rather than planning economic activities, the state might focus on creating and enforcing laws that support the coexistence of markets 
and communist enterprises. It might also engage in cultural campaigns and education to instill norms necessary for this social combination. However, this scenario raises several questions. Does the coexistence of generalized commodity production and communist class processes in enterprises threaten the survival of these communist class processes? How does the notion of collectivity among workers fare in the competitive, individualistic, and alienating environment of markets? Are markets inherently linked to capitalism? In addressing these concerns, we must consider the complex, contradictory relationship between wage labor and class structures. In capitalist systems, workers selling their labor power to capitalists experience alienation from their surplus labor the labor process, its fruits, and even from each other. This alienation can lead to problems like low motivation and productivity, threatening the survival of capitalist enterprises. Similarly, if workers sold their labor power to communist enterprises, similar problems could arise, potentially undermining communist class structures. However, the relationship between wage labor and class structures is not one-dimensional. Capitalist economies have developed ways to manage the alienation of wage earners. Similarly, societies with communist class structures within enterprises might find ways to manage alienation. Moreover, individuals' motivations and productivities are shaped by multiple factors, not just market processes. Communist class structures would interact with other social processes to shape workers' experiences in the market and production. The coexistence of communist class structures and markets also involves dealing with market instabilities, such as unemployment. How communist societies respond to these challenges through state policies or private sector adjustments can significantly impact the survival and evolution of communist class structures. In conclusion, the relationship between communist class structures, markets, and state interventions is complex and fraught with contradictions and tensions. The survival of communist class structures in such a setting is contingent on various factors, including how markets, communist enterprises and state interventions interact and cope with challenges. This dynamic interaction could lead to the evolution of various forms of communism, each with its unique characteristics and challenges. Part 3 Class and Power Imagine a society where communism isn't just a singular monolithic structure, but a spectrum of possibilities each with its unique interplay of class and power. This is not just a theoretical exercise, but a crucial understanding for anyone grappling with the complexities of communism in both historical and contemporary contexts. Let's start by picturing a society of M, adult individuals. Within this society, a subset N is actively engaged in communist enterprises, producing, appropriating, and distributing surplus labor. The remaining M and individuals are not directly involved in these communist processes. Now, consider how power, the authority to govern and direct activities and relationships, including those related to the communist class structure, is distributed among these individuals. This distribution of power is pivotal, as it shapes the form and function of communism in the society. Firstly, Imagine a scenario where every one of the M adults holds equal power. This could be termed a complete social democracy, where everyone has an equal say in ordering social activities and relationships, including those tied to the communist class structure. In this setup, the incommunist workers, while they manage the surplus, must share decision-making power equally with all other citizens. This form of communism could be appealing due to its egalitarian nature, but it's not without potential tensions and contradictions, especially between the incommunist workers and the M and non-workers. Now, consider a different distribution of power, one where only the incommunist workers have equal power, a complete class democracy. This arrangement might reduce some tensions by concentrating power among those directly involved in producing and managing the surplus. However, it could also lead to new conflicts, as the communist workers might take actions that are unfavorable to the non-workers. The third possibility is an oligarchy, where power is vested in the hands of the MN non-workers, or even more extremely, in a single despot. This form of power distribution creates a stark separation between those who manage the surplus and those who wield broader social power. Such a structure could coexist with communist class structures, but would likely lead to its own unique set of contradictions and tensions. These scenarios illustrate 
that there is no invariant link between communist enterprises and a particular social distribution of power. The relationship between class and power within any society is complex and not deducible from one another. Each distinct coexistence of communist enterprises and a particular social distribution of power displays its unique contradictions. But let's push our understanding further. Beyond these variants of communism lies the concept of a classless communist society. This idea, suggested by Marxian theory, envisions a society where the division between necessary and surplus labor dissolves. In such a society, all labor contributes equally to the production of use values, and no portion of labor is designated as surplus. This absence of class processes would necessitate a radical reorganization of work and the allocation of products. It would require a society where the distribution of skills, education, and cultural ethos supports this classlessness, and where politics directly addresses the needs and wants of the community, unencumbered by the imperatives of maintaining a class structure. In a classless society, the absence of class divisions could contribute to a more democratic political and cultural life. The collectivity of labor, now freed from the constraints of class, could become a direct object of democratic decision-making. This vision of classlessness aligns with the Marxist ideal of, from each according to ability, to each according to need. As we contemplate the future of our societies, understanding the variability of communism and the potential for a classless society becomes crucial. Theories that recognize the diversity of class processes and the possibility of their disappearance can broaden our discussions about possible futures, facilitating a transition to a society where class distinctions no longer dictate the dynamics of power and production. Part 4 Socialism and Communism In our journey to understand the multifaceted nature of communism, we've encountered various interpretations and structures, each intertwining class dynamics with the complex web of social life encompassing alternative distributions of property and power. Yet, there lies a horizon beyond these class-based forms, a horizon that beckons us to consider the concept of a classless communist society. Marxian theory, with its rich tapestry of class analysis, not only allows but compels us to explore this notion. It's a journey that takes us to the very edges of the theory's conceptual boundaries. Here, we're not just applying Marx's class analytics to communism, we're also peering beyond, acknowledging the limitations of these analytics. Consider Marx's own words in his letter to Joseph Weidemeyer. While he credited bourgeois historians with identifying class and class conflict, he highlighted his unique contributions, a specific definition of class in terms of surplus production relations, the concept of the dictatorship of the proletariat, and the vision of a transition towards a classless society. Yet Marx's exploration of classlessness was less thorough than his analysis of class in terms of surplus. This leaves us a space, a space to build an understanding of what a classless society might entail. The term classless society is intriguing in itself, defined more by what it lacks than what it possesses. In such a society, the fundamental Marxian distinction between necessary and surplus labor dissolves. This dissolution marks the end of the class process as we know it, much like how other historical phenomena have faded into obscurity. But what does this absence of class processes truly mean? It raises profound questions about the nature of labor, the organization of society, and the very fabric of our social interactions. In a world without class processes, labor is no longer divided into necessary and surplus. Every form of human labor, whether in producing goods, developing culture, or shaping politics, becomes a unified, necessary part of the societal fabric. Imagine a society where the organization of work, the allocation of products, is driven not by class needs, but by the collective needs and wants of the community. The very notion of profit, rent, or interest as class categories becomes irrelevant. This is the essence of classlessness. However, achieving and sustaining such a society requires more than just the absence of class structures. It demands a radical transformation in politics, culture, and education. Politics must evolve to directly address the what, how, and for whom of production, free from the constraints of class maintenance. Culturally, 
there must be a universal development of skills and an ethic prioritizing equality and classlessness. The transition to classlessness also implies profound social effects. It challenges hierarchical divisions, democratizes political and cultural life, and opens up new possibilities for collective decision-making. It embodies the principle of, from each according to ability, to each according to need. As we look towards the future, the role of Marxian theory becomes crucial. It's not just about understanding the differences between communist and non-communist class structures, but also about envisioning the transition to classlessness. Theories that fail to acknowledge the possibility of a classless society may inadvertently hinder our journey towards it. In conclusion, the concept of a classless society extends our discourse on communism, challenging us to envision a future beyond the confines of class and surplus. It's a bold step, one that requires us to reimagine the very foundations of our social structures and relationships. Socialism and communism, comparing and contrasting socialism and communism, involves delving into their definitions, interpretations, and the various perspectives from which they are viewed. Here's a bullet point comparison and contrast based on the provided text. Similarities 1. Broad isms. Both socialism and communism are broad terms that invite diverse interpretations based on economic, political, or cultural perspectives. 2. Utopian dystopian visions. They are often associated with utopian ideals or dystopian fears, influencing interpretations and expectations. 3. Focus on power structures. Contemporary thinkers, both left and right, often focus on the organization and distribution of power in defining and assessing socialism and communism. 4. Cultural considerations. Both ideologies are sometimes defined in terms of cultural aspects, particularly in how they shape human consciousness and ethics. 5. Economic aspects. Economically, they are often associated with collectivized property ownership and the suppression of market mechanisms in favor of economic planning. 6. Perceived failures. There is a general consensus across different viewpoints that the 20th century experiments in socialism and communism, e.g. in the USSR, China, Cuba, were failures, though the reasons for these failures are debated. Differences 1. Class processes and classlessness. Communism is defined as a social formation where communist class processes and classless production arrangements predominate, whereas socialism does not necessarily involve a class process or classlessness. 2. State intervention and social welfare. Socialism is often associated with state economic intervention, state-provided social safety nets, and income equality, irrespective of its surplus labor dimensions. 3. Transitionary nature. Socialism is sometimes seen as a transitional phase between capitalism and communism, but this is not a universally accepted view. 4. Dictatorship of the proletariat. The concept differs in the two ideologies. In communism, it implies state support for communist class structures and classlessness, whereas in socialism, it relates to state management and regulation of the economy for broader social welfare and equality. 5. Political democracy. The presence or absence of political democracy is often a central defining characteristic of genuine socialism and communism, but this is subject to debate. 6. Teleological differences. The text rejects the notion that socialism necessarily leads to communism, emphasizing that transitions can occur in any direction among various social structures. 7. Practical application and historical context. The application and interpretation of socialism and communism have varied historically and geographically, often leading to inconsistencies in their definitions and practical implementations. In summary, while socialism and communism share broad thematic similarities in terms of their economic, political, and cultural dimensions, they differ significantly in their conceptualization of class processes the role of the state, the nature of their transition, and their practical applications in historical contexts. Notes. Summary of key takeaways. 1. Evolution of theoretical perspectives. The work of theorists like Huron and Majilewski highlights the evolving nature of socialist and communist theories. 2. Universal participation in governance. The idea of mandating voting in all elections, regardless of individual differences, is a concept that transcends both communist and capitalist societies. 3. Changing nature of capitalism. 
the role of corporate boards and the separation of ownership, management, and surplus appropriation in contemporary capitalism reflect its evolving nature, comparable to changes in communist systems. For market coexistence with various class structures, Marx acknowledged that markets could coexist with different class structures, indicating a more nuanced understanding of economic systems. 5. Communist Collective Dynamics the concept of a communist collective hiring individual members parallels capitalist structures where boards hire managers. 6. Determinism and Worker Consciousness The classic Marxian theory of alienation and the role of markets in shaping worker consciousness are debated with a rejection of determinism and an acknowledgement of the complexity of alienation. 7. Complexity of Economic Analysis the difficulty in measuring the net effects of economic events, like market failures, highlights the limitations of cost-benefit analyses and their inherent biases. 8. Class Perspectives in State Policies State policies and different economic systems, communist versus capitalist, reflect distinct class goals and approaches to employment and exploitation. 9. Debates on the USSR's Socialism Discussions about whether the USSR was truly socialist often revolve around the extent of its substantive democracy. 10. Class structures in various societies. The recognition of different class structures, including communist ones, coexisting with various forms of governance like despotism. 11. Class analysis and surplus labor. The importance of focusing on surplus labor in class analysis and the issue of class blindness in other approaches. 12. Communism and in classlessness. The understanding of communism as classless and the need to incorporate the concept of classlessness in class analysis. 13. Labor analysis in economic theories. The distinction between necessary and surplus labor in Marxist analysis versus the neoclassical economic theories approach. 14. Critical assessment of definitions. The importance of critically assessing definitions of socialism and communism in the literature. 15. Communism as a goal in Soviet socialism. The Soviet Union's view of communism as a future goal rather than its current state, and the ideological nuances in post-1990 assertions about the collapse of communism in Eastern Europe. Part 5 State Capitalism In exploring the multifaceted landscape of economic systems, it becomes imperative to delve into the concept of state capitalism, particularly through the lens of class theory. This approach not only enriches our understanding of capitalism's diverse forms, but also highlights the intricate interplay between capitalist class structures and various non-class processes. The concept of state capitalism, defined as a system where state officials assume the role of appropriators and distributors of surplus rather than private individuals, offers a unique vantage point to examine the complexities of economic and political power structures. Historically, State capitalism has emerged in various contexts, often as a response to the perceived limitations or crises of private capitalism, or as an ideological choice. It represents a paradigm where the state, rather than acting as a mere regulator or facilitator, becomes an active capitalist player. This involvement ranges from direct investment and management of enterprises to the appropriation and redistribution of surplus generated by workers. This form of capitalism, while sharing some characteristics with its private counterpart, diverges significantly in terms of ownership, control, and the distribution of economic benefits. The evolution of state capitalism in the Soviet Union, particularly in its industrial and agricultural sectors, provides a critical case study. It exemplifies how state capitalism can function and evolve, challenging traditional notions of both capitalist and communist economic structures. Unlike private capitalism, where surplus accrues to private owners or shareholders, in state capitalism, this surplus is controlled and distributed by state entities. This shift in control and distribution has profound implications for workers, who, while still engaged in surplus production, face a different set of dynamics in their labor relations and rights. Globally, state capitalism is not an anomaly 
confined to communist states, or those with centrally planned economies. It manifests in various forms across the world, with differing degrees of state intervention and control in the economy. This includes scenarios where governments own or control key sectors, even within predominantly market-based economies. The coexistence of state capitalism with market mechanisms further adds to its complexity, as state-operated enterprises may participate in competitive markets or exert significant control over them. The objectives driving state capitalism are as diverse as its forms, ranging from economic development and social welfare to national security and political consolidation. These goals profoundly influence how the state functions as a capitalist entity, affecting everything from investment decisions to labor policies. In summary, the class theory perspective on state capitalism not only sheds light on the economic mechanisms at play, but also unravels the social and political dimensions of this economic form. It provides a comprehensive framework to understand how different forms of capitalism, influenced by varying motivations and goals, shape societies, economies, and the global economic landscape. Capitalisms and Exploitation Good morning, students. Today, we delve into a critical aspect of economic theory and history, the nature of capitalism and its intrinsic relationship with exploitation. Our discussion will be grounded in the foundational works of Marx and the evolution of capitalist systems over time. Let's begin by understanding the fundamental premise of capitalist class processes. In a capitalist system, there is a clear distinction between those who produce surplus and those who appropriate it. The producers of surplus often the laborers, do not get to appropriate what they produce. This disconnection is the crux of exploitation in capitalism. The capitalist and the laborer are distinct entities, and their relationship is inherently exploitative. In contrast, let's consider communist class processes. Here, the producers of surplus are also its appropriators. This collective appropriation in communist systems means that the exploitative element present in capitalism is absent. Now. Let's turn to Marx's theory of capitalism. Marx identified several features of capitalism relevant to the time and context he was writing in. For instance, in his seminal work, Capital, he discusses the exchange of privately owned commodities as a key feature of capitalism. However, it's crucial to note that Marx did not assert that capitalist exploitation is inextricably linked to commodities and markets alone. Capitalism, as he saw it, could coexist with various social conditions and take multiple forms. This brings us to an important point, the evolution and variation within capitalist systems. For example, Marx briefly touched upon state capitalism, where the government functions as an industrial capitalist, as seen in the operation of mines and railways. This form of capitalism, where state entities own and operate productive assets, represents a shift from private to state forms of capitalism. It's essential to recognize that private capitalism itself can take numerous forms. These range from decentralized structures, where surplus is produced and appropriated across various enterprises, to more centralized forms, where surplus production is widespread, but appropriation is concentrated. The ownership of productive assets also varies in private capitalism, from classic private owners to modern corporations with shareholders and board directors. Moreover, capitalist class structures can coexist with different market forms, be it free markets, state-regulated markets, or non-market allocations by the state. The nature of these markets and the degree of state intervention or regulation can lead to various private forms of capitalism. Now, let's consider state capitalism more closely. In state capitalism, surplus appropriating enterprises are located within the state apparatus, and individuals connected to the state exploit labor. This form of capitalism can manifest in numerous ways, from state capitalist enterprises operating within predominantly private capitalist systems, to scenarios where private capitalist enterprises are marginalized, as seen in Soviet industry post-1920s. State capitalist enterprises can also coexist with different distributions of property in the means of production. Whether these assets are collectively or privately owned, the nature of allocations and the criteria set for them can lead to diverse state forms of capitalism. In conclusion, 
our exploration today underscores the complexity and variability of capitalism. Whether in private or state forms, the fundamental aspect of exploitation as defined by the appropriation of surplus remains central. As we continue to study these systems, it's crucial to understand not just their operational modes, but also their underlying class and private dimensions. This understanding is key to comprehensively grasping the historical and contemporary landscapes of capitalist economies. Thank you, and I look forward to our continued discussions on this topic. Part 6 Capitalist and Communism, Justifying the Label Capitalist in the Context of the USSR, Welcome students. Today, we will embark on a critical examination of the Soviet Union's economic structure, particularly addressing the question, was the USSR truly a state capitalist society? This inquiry requires us to delve into Marxist theories and the broader Marxist framework, which identifies different kinds of exploitative class structures. Firstly, let's understand the three primary exploitative class structures recognized by Marx and Marxism slave, feudal, and capitalist. To discern which structure is prevalent in a society, we must scrutinize how various non-class processes interact to shape its class structure. Our focus is the USSR. An initial review of Soviet history and documentation reveals no significant evidence of a slave class structure. In such a structure, human beings are treated as property, divided into slaves and masters, with the former producing surplus for the immediate appropriation of the latter. This structure often necessitates a culture of subservience, a political system enforcing property rights in humans, and an economic system akin to breeding work animals. However, in the Soviet context, there was no indication of such a system where laborers functioned as slaves to surplus appropriating masters within state enterprises. Moving on to the possibility of a feudal class structure, this would involve a different set of cultural, political, and economic conditions. Feudalism is characterized by formal relationships of bondage, where surplus is produced under personal bonds rather than voluntary exchanges among free individuals. In historical feudal Europe, for example, serfs were bound to land or lords, producing surplus in the form of rents or labor. However, the Soviet system did not align with this model. Soviet workers, though sometimes limited in their rights, were nominally free to choose their employment and had some degree of control over their work conditions. This freedom, coupled with the contractual nature of labor relationships in the USSR, diverges significantly from feudal bondage. Thus, we turn to the hypothesis that the USSR exhibited a capitalist class structure. This hypothesis is not solely based on the elimination of slave or feudal structures, but also on the specific conditions within the Soviet Union. Soviet workers, despite their nominal freedoms, were compelled to sell their labor power in state-owned enterprises under exploitative conditions. This situation, where limited freedom coexists with a structured compulsion to produce surplus for others, closely mirrors the condition of workers in private capitalist structures globally. In the Soviet system, the state played a central role in appropriating and distributing the surplus produced by workers. State officials, acting as appropriators, manage the production, appropriation, and distribution of surplus, akin to the role of corporate boards in private capitalist enterprises. This parallel suggests different forms of capitalism, rather than a departure from capitalist class processes. Moreover, Soviet culture and politics emphasize the liberation of workers from feudal and private capitalist exploitation, framing their work in state enterprises as a contribution to a socialist economy. This narrative masked the ongoing exploitation and surplus appropriation within these state enterprises. The state's role in setting commodity values and wage levels, determining surplus size and allocating resources further reinforced a capitalist class structure, albeit under state management. In conclusion, the Soviet Union's shift from private property and market mechanisms to collective property and state planning did not eliminate worker exploitation. Instead, it transformed the means of exploitation, establishing a state form of capitalism. This analysis challenges the traditional Marxist view that equated state property and planning with socialism, revealing the continuation of capitalist class processes within the Soviet state enterprises. As we continue to explore these complex economic structures, it's crucial to critically assess 
not just the outward forms of governance and ownership, but the underlying class dynamics and processes of surplus production and appropriation. This understanding is vital for a comprehensive grasp of the historical and contemporary economic systems. Thank you, and I look forward to our discussions on these topics. Part 6 Value Analysis for State Capitalism In this discussion, we delve into a technical aspect of Marxian economics, particularly focusing on the concept of value in the context of state capitalism, using the USSR as a prime example. This analysis challenges traditional notions that define capitalism strictly in terms of producing commodities for free markets, and consequently, the idea that the absence of free markets in the USSR negates its classification as capitalist. Let's begin by considering the traditional literature which often equates capitalism with the production of commodities for free markets. This perspective leads to the conclusion that the USSR, having suppressed free markets, was not capitalist. However, our analysis aims to challenge this view. We argue that capitalist class structures can coexist with various forms of resource and product distribution, ranging from free markets to state-regulated or even non-market mechanisms. This concept is not unique to capitalism. As we discussed in a previous chapter, communist class structures can also interact with both market and non-market distribution mechanisms. In the Soviet model of state capitalism, the primary mechanism for distribution was state planning. Soviet planners defined, calculated, and announced the values of outputs produced in state enterprises, which we refer to as administered values. These outputs were exchanged within an administered market at these state-determined values, rather than at values emerging from private bargaining in a free market. This approach to value determination involved calculating the socially necessary abstract labor time for each product, encompassing both the direct labor involved in production and the labor embodied in the raw materials and tools used. The difference between the value added during production and the value of commodities that workers could purchase with their state-allocated wages represents the state-administered surplus value appropriated in these enterprises. Soviet planners could set actual prices to equal these state-administered values or establish differences between values and prices, similar to how competition in private capitalism can lead to divergences between commodity prices and their values. This approach to value and price setting in state capitalism necessitates a re-evaluation of terms like value, price, and profit. In capitalism, these terms need qualifying adjectives, market set versus state administered, to acknowledge and distinguish the different exchange mechanisms. Marxian value theory, with its focus on class processes in production and the distinction between necessary and surplus labor, highlights class as one determinant, among others, of actual prices in both free and administered markets. This focus is what sets Marxian theory apart from other value theories that overlook or deny the class determinant. In a state capitalism that foregoes exchange and commodities, and thus values, Marxian value theory would not apply. However, most modern economies, including both private and state capitalisms, rely on either markets or state agencies to produce a system of prices. Therefore, Marxian value theory remains relevant in these contexts. State-administered prices and profit rates may have significant social consequences, influencing how state planning agencies allocate resources among state capitalist enterprises. These agencies might favor enterprises with higher-than-average profits or consider profit rates alongside other variables like military needs, cultural goals, or regional stability. In the Soviet form of state capitalism, competition among state enterprises manifested in various strategies, such as bonuses, bribes, and quota overachievement. These strategies, while unique to the Soviet system in some respects, also bear similarities to competitive strategies in private capitalism. However, certain strategies common in private capitalism, like advertising and mergers, were typically absent in state forms like the USSR. The presence of competition, whether in state or private capitalism, leads to a complex interplay of effects throughout the economy impacting enterprises, households, and state agencies. This complexity makes it impossible to isolate and quantify the total consequences of any particular competitive strategy or to definitively rank the efficiency of different strategies 
or economic systems. In conclusion, the choice between state and private capitalism, or between either and forms of communism, cannot logically rest on a universal efficiency standard. Such appeals, while rhetorically effective, do not hold up under rigorous epistemological scrutiny. This analysis underscores the complexity and variability of economic systems and the need for a nuanced understanding of value, price, and competition in different forms of capitalism. Part 7. Capitalisms, Communisms, and Socialisms Capitalism variability, exists in various forms, including mixes of state and private enterprises, ownership of production means, and combinations of markets and planning. Class structure. Common capitalist class structures across all forms entail exploitation varying in intensity and nature with each form. Quality of life dependent on the specific form of capitalism, affecting living conditions and societal dynamics. Management and control involves both state and private capitalist enterprises, with exploitation often requiring supervisory managers to maximize surplus. Crisis and oscillation, prone to cycles and crises, often leading to shifts between more or less state intervention. Communism, class structure, Ideally, the producers of surplus are its collective appropriators, negating capitalist exploitation. Misconceptions, often confused with forms of socialism or state capitalism, true communism involves a distinct class structure focused on surplus labor. Historical implementation, in practice often conflated with state capitalism, as seen in the USSR, where state functionaries appropriated surplus labor. Potential transition, Theoretical possibility of transitioning from capitalism to communism, but historically, this has not been realized due to various factors, including class consciousness and political dynamics. Socialism, state capitalism, often equated with state capitalism, involving state ownership of productive assets, regulation of markets, and provision of basic welfare. Variability can range from minimal to extensive state intervention in the economy. Democratic aspects envisions a more democratic egalitarian approach compared to private capitalism, though this varies in implementation. Crisis response. Historically, socialism has been a response to crises in private capitalism, leading to more state management. Misconceptions. Frequently confused with communism, socialism in practice has often been a form of state capitalism rather than a negation of capitalist class structures. Key differences and similarities. Class structure. Capitalism and socialism, as practiced, share capitalist class structures, while communism proposes a fundamentally different class structure. State involvement. Both socialism and communism involve state roles, but socialism often retains capitalist class dynamics, whereas communism seeks to abolish them. Crisis response. Capitalism and socialism both have mechanisms for responding to economic crises, often leading to shifts in state involvement. Misconceptions and confusions. Communism is often misunderstood as extreme socialism or conflated with state capitalism, obscuring its distinct class structure focus. Historical implementations. The practical applications of these ideologies have often diverged from their theoretical foundations, particularly in the case of communism and socialism. Good evening, everyone. Today, we delve into the intricate world of capitalism, its various forms, and the implications these have on our lives and societies. Often, when we speak of capitalism, we imagine a monolithic system, but in reality, it's far more complex and diverse. Let's begin by understanding that capitalism isn't a one-size-fits-all model. It exists in numerous forms, lending state and private enterprises, ownership models, and planning methods. Whether it's centralized or decentralized planning, market-driven or state-controlled economies, the essence of capitalism, the capitalist class structure and the inherent exploitation remains consistent, albeit varying in intensity and manifestation. Consider, for instance, the Scandinavian model, often cited as a blend of market capitalism and strong welfare policies. Here, private ownership and market mechanisms thrive, but are balanced by state interventions in the form of extensive social welfare programs. This model contrasts sharply with the laissez-faire approach seen in the United States, where state intervention is minimal and market forces largely dictate economic outcomes. Moving to state forms of capitalism, let's take the example of China. Here, the state plays a pivotal role in directing economic activities, 
owning and controlling major industries. Yet alongside this, there's a burgeoning private sector, driven by market forces and private ownership. This blend creates a unique capitalist structure, distinct from Western models. Now, it's crucial to distinguish these forms of capitalism from communist class structures. While both state and private capitalism involve the appropriation of workers' surplus labor by a ruling class, in a communist structure, this surplus would ideally be controlled and used by the workers themselves. However, historical examples like the Soviet Union complicate this narrative. The Soviet model, often labeled as communist, was in many ways a state capitalist system, where the state functioned as the capitalist, appropriating and distributing surplus labor. The Soviet example also brings us to the concept of workers' self-management, a notion often confused with communism. In reality, Self-management can exist within a capitalist framework. The Yugoslav model in the mid-20th century is an illustrative case where enterprises were worker-managed but operated within a market economy, maintaining the capitalist class structure. It's also important to note how capitalism in both state and private forms has historically oscillated in response to crises. The Great Depression in the 1930s led to increased state intervention in capitalist economies a trend that reversed in the late 20th century with the rise of neoliberalism. Similarly, the Soviet Union's shift from war communism to the new economic policy in the 1920s demonstrated an oscillation from state to a mixed form of capitalism. In conclusion, understanding capitalism's varied forms is crucial. It's not just a choice between state and private capitalism, but recognizing the nuances within these systems. As we've seen, from Scandinavia's welfare capitalism to China's state-driven model and the Soviet Union's state capitalist structure, each presents different outcomes in terms of exploitation, quality of life, and societal organization. As we move forward, it's essential to critically examine these systems, understanding their intricacies, to better shape our economic and social policies. Debates and Criticism Over State Capitalism From the outset of the Russian Revolution, the classification of the USSR's class structure has been a subject of intense debate among supporters, critics, and observers. A common consensus among many admirers and even some critics was that the USSR represented a form of socialism on the path to communism. However, opinions varied significantly. Some critics perceived it as a distorted or malformed version of socialism or collectivism. Others viewed it as a form of bureaucratic or state capitalism. There were even interpretations that likened the USSR's class structure to a hybrid of private and state capitalism, drawing parallels with European fascist regimes. This array of descriptors, just a few among many, highlights not only the unique nature of the USSR's class structure, but also the deep-rooted disagreements on how to interpret it. The debate, fueled by strong emotions, ideological biases, and significant practical implications, has been a recurring theme from 1917 to the present. A notable aspect of this debate centers on the term state capitalism. However, it's important to note that neither the proponents nor the critics of this term, when applied to the USSR, have defined it in the way we did in the previous chapter. Their use of capitalist often pertains to specific patterns of ownership of production means, or more commonly, to particular distributions of political power, or a mix of both. Consequently, the long-standing disputes over the definition of class re-emerge. While we employ a surplus labor concept of class to analyze the USSR's class structure as predominantly capitalist, other interpretations of state capitalism have either marginalized or completely overlooked the concept of surplus labor. This chapter aims to show how these differing approaches lead to fundamentally distinct analyses and conclusions from our own debates. The concept of state capitalism has been a subject of extensive debate, with various interpretations and arguments presented over time. This section aims to distill the essence of these debates and the differing perspectives. Early views by Marx and Engels Marx and Engels acknowledged the potential for state officials to replace private capitalists. They noted that the essence of capitalist exploitation could remain largely unchanged even with this shift. Their observations were brief, likely due to the rarity of state capitalism at the time. However, 
they emphasized that the replacement of private individuals by state officials did not fundamentally alter the nature of capitalist exploitation. Marxist interpretations pre-Soviet revolution. Before the Soviet revolution, many Marxists developed a different concept of state capitalism. They observed that modern European states were increasingly regulating, subsidizing, and coordinating private capitalist enterprises. This was seen as a new phase in the development of capitalism, where state interventions significantly altered the logic and dynamics of capitalism. Karl Renner, writing in 1916, suggested that this form of state capitalism was an unforeseen development in Marxist theory, where the state not only aids in capital concentration, but also begins to merge with the economy. This interpretation of state capitalism focused more on state intervention in and control over private capitalist enterprises, rather than direct state appropriation of surplus. Austro-Marxists and German Marxists, figures like Rudolf Hilferding, Max Adler, Otto Bauer, and Karl Kautsky, along with Lenin, echoed similar views. They saw the state as a stabilizing force for private capitalism, intervening to prevent or mitigate crises. Lenin's imperialism, the highest stage of capitalism, drew on these theories, influencing the USSR's policies and perspectives. Debates over state capitalism's role in transition to socialism. One side of the debate viewed state capitalism as the ultimate preparation for transitioning from capitalism to socialism. They believed it represented the final stage of socializing production within capitalism's framework. This view was supported by Engels' notion of state capitalism as containing the technical conditions for a transition to socialism. Proponents like Bukharin argued that state capitalism would lead to a socialist revolution, abolishing private property and establishing a genuinely democratic society serving workers' interests. Opposing views on state capitalism the opposing view was wary of simply taking over state capitalism. This perspective argued that socialism required a profound historical discontinuity, necessitating the destruction of both capitalist relations of production and the capitalist state. They believed that merely abolishing private property was insufficient for a transition from state capitalism to socialism. A radical break with the past, in terms of both productive enterprises and the state, was deemed necessary. This side focused on the need for a radical change in the social distribution of power, altering who controlled enterprises and the state before and after any revolution. The question of whether the workers had truly gained control over the state was central to the debates about state capitalism. Doubts were raised about whether a workers' revolution could inadvertently allow state capitalism to persist, especially if the revolution was betrayed, leading to bureaucrats, rather than workers, holding real power. This raised a critical question. If workers did not have genuine power over the state, could the state's nationalization of productive property genuinely transform state capitalism into socialism, or would it simply result in a different variant of state capitalism? The focus of these debates was increasingly on the concept of power, both in terms of control over property and political influence. In these early discussions, the way surplus labor was managed in state versus private capitalism, or in socialism versus state capitalism, was largely overlooked. Instead, the debates crystallized around a fundamentally political issue, the social distribution of control over the state and production. Prior to 1917, these differing viewpoints influenced and were influenced by the strategies of various anti-capitalist parties and factions. Post-1917, these debates solidified into significant conflicts, particularly in relation to the evolving class structure within the USSR. A key argument from critics of Soviet development was that the USSR had not progressed beyond state capitalism. They contended that the revolution had stalled midway, failing to transition from private capitalism to socialism. Despite the formal abolition of private property, they argued that actual control and power had coalesced around the Communist Party and a state bureaucracy without achieving a significant shift in power dynamics. This was seen as a failure to break away from the traditional power held by a few over the many. Moreover, by emphasizing the dominant role of the Communist Party, positioned as the vanguard representative of all Soviet workers, 
state capitalism was effectively being despised as socialism. As the prominent Marxian Menshevik Martov suggested, Soviet workers were enduring the hardships and injustices typical of capitalism within the concentrated state capitalism of a backward society. In the early years following the Russian Revolution, defenders of the Soviet Union's development path, including Lenin himself, embraced the concept of state capitalism, but with a positive connotation. Echoing Engels, they viewed Soviet state capitalism as an essential transitional phase between the overthrow of capitalism and the realization of socialism, and eventually communism. Lenin, confronting the unpredictable nature of social conditions, periodically advocated for a controlled form of state capitalism as a means to socialist ends. He believed that the workers were moving towards socialism through the capitalist management of trusts and large-scale industry. For Lenin, the workers, not being petty bourgeois, were not intimidated by large-scale state capitalism, but rather valued it as a proletarian tool wielded by their Soviet power. Lenin argued that state capitalism, under the control of workers committed to socialism, i.e. the communists, was an acceptable and necessary stage for the USSR to traverse. The ongoing transition was contingent on the security of Soviet power. In his view, it was not the organization of surplus labor that was crucial but rather the power dynamics that were central to these qualified endorsements of state capitalism in the USSR. After Lenin's death in 1923, the term state capitalism became less common among defenders of the USSR as a descriptor for state industry. With Stalin's rise to power in the late 1920s, the term virtually disappeared. Instead, those who admired or defended the USSR's class structure labeled it socialism. They reasoned that by abolishing private property in the means of production, replacing markets with state planning, and subordinating the state to the workers' power via the Communist Party, the USSR had eradicated capitalist exploitation and classes altogether. With socialism established and communism on the horizon, there seemed no need for class analyses of Soviet society. Lenin and others, under various pressures, also offered alternative definitions of state capitalism and its relationship to socialism. At times, they characterized large state-owned and operated enterprises as capitalist due to their hierarchical authority and wage structures and the involvement of capitalists and bourgeois technicians. Lenin saw the state monopoly capitalism as a progressive step towards socialism in a truly revolutionary democratic state. He believed that the Soviet state could and would transform it into socialism in the near future. Trotsky echoed this sentiment, emphasizing that the dictatorship of the proletariat was not about how individual economic enterprises were administered, but about the abolition of private property in the means of production and the supremacy of the workers' collective will. This evolution in Soviet thought acknowledged that state-owned industrial enterprises could be capitalist in nature due to their internal organizational structures. However, these capitalist organizations of production were seen as temporary steps towards socialism, controlled by the Soviet state. Eventually, such state-owned and operated industries were considered socialist by virtue of their subordination to the power of the Soviet state, rendering their internal organization of production were relevant to the distinction between capitalism and socialism. In the theoretical landscape shaped by Lenin and Trotsky, state capitalism and socialism are distinguished not by the functioning of their productive enterprises, but by who controls these enterprises and for what purposes. Lenin succinctly stated, socialism is nothing but state capitalist monopoly made to benefit the whole people. Thus, it ceases to be capitalist monopoly. This perspective shifted the focus of debates over state capitalism and socialism in the USSR from the nature of production processes to questions of control and management, who holds the reins of the economy, sets wage levels, and determines policy goals. Central to these debates was the issue of power distribution, whether control over enterprises lay with the state or with others. This focus on power, rather than the presence of exploitation within production structures, became the key criterion for differentiating socialism 
from capitalism. Trotsky, emphasizing power dynamics, rejected the notion of state capitalism as irrelevant to the USSR. He argued that replacing private with state ownership of production means, shifting control from private hands to the state, was fundamentally incompatible with capitalism. For Trotsky, the complete expropriation of private capital in the USSR which removed control from private capitalists, rendered the term state capitalism inapplicable and misleading. He saw the distribution of power over productive assets as the decisive factor in determining the USSR's class nature. However, Trotsky also acknowledged that the Soviet bureaucracy's political actions could distort the achievements of 1917, potentially leading back to private capitalism. He focused on the distribution of power within the USSR as the crucial factor in determining its future trajectory. Both Lenin and Trotsky, in their respective ways, steered discussions about the USSR towards an analysis not of exploitation or surplus labor organization, but primarily of power distribution. Consequently, questions about the real power of Soviet workers, their influence through the party, and the control exerted by state bureaucrats and party officials became central. Debates revolved around whether these groups acted in opposition to workers' interests, potentially forming new exploiting classes, and how Soviet history reflected the interplay and conflicts among workers, state bureaucrats, and party personnel. The emphasis on power dynamics has since characterized most discussions about state capitalism and other aspects of Soviet society. The specific contexts that shaped Lenin's and his contemporaries' arguments have receded, leaving their theoretical frameworks as the foundation for ongoing debates. These discussions have continually returned to the pivotal issue of workers' power in industry and the state, shaping the ongoing efforts to define and understand the relationship between state capitalism and socialism in the USSR. Power and Force-Centric Argument and Flaws In the discourse surrounding socialism and state capitalism, a key theme is the struggle for power following the revolution, often framed as a contest between workers and capitalists or their representatives. This struggle is seen as pivotal in determining whether socialism or a form of state capitalism disguised as socialism, would prevail in the USSR. Raya Dunyevskaya, for instance, highlighted two conflicting planning principles in the USSR, one favoring the workers and the other the capitalists. The latter, focused on capital accumulation at the expense of consumption, ultimately dominated, leading to a form of state capitalism under the guise of socialism. Dunyevskaya's analysis centered on power distribution as the defining factor between state capitalism and socialism, with the prevailing planning principle reflecting the dominant power structure. Similarly, the group socialism or barbarism emphasized that genuine collective ownership of production means is unattainable unless workers directly manage production determining both methods and objectives. This perspective, echoing earlier Bolshevik views, posits that socialism can only be realized through the workers' own efforts. Otherwise, what emerges is state capitalism. In 1925, Zinoviev's analysis of the new economic policy, NEP, suggested that it had shifted power to such an extent that the USSR had veered towards state capitalism in a proletarian state. These analyses consistently focus on who holds power, rather than the production, appropriation, and distribution of surplus labor. Buck Herin, countering the state capitalism thesis, argued that state capitalism is impossible under a proletariat dictatorship as it presupposes a capitalist state. For him, the nature of state control by workers through the Communist Party negated the possibility of state capitalism, indicating a transition towards socialism. The debates often presented power as a bipolar concept, either in the hands of workers or non-workers. If non-workers, particularly state and party functionaries, held power, Capitalism would prevail despite societal ownership of production means. Bettelheim's analysis of Soviet state enterprises dissected the notion of property into an issue of power, identifying a de facto separation of workers from their means of production, effectively controlled by enterprise managers. This distribution of power 
rather than formal property relations, defined capitalism for Bettelheim. Some analysts argued that Soviet socialism was compromised in favor of capitalism due to insufficient transformation in power distribution. Communism's goal was seen as replacing an exploitative and oppressive form of power with a popular and emancipatory one shifting focus from surplus production processes to political struggles. Discussions on state capitalism also scrutinized power hierarchies within production sites. The presence of hierarchy, equated with power over workers, was seen as indicative of capitalism, while a non-hierarchical organization was deemed socialist or communist. C.L.R. James, for instance, described the USSR as state capitalistic in terms of administration, supervision, and control against the proletariat, and viewed hierarchical organization in production as the essence of capitalist authority. In these debates, the focus on power dynamics, rather than the mechanics of surplus production, appropriation, and distribution, became central in differentiating socialism from state capitalism. This shift in focus led to a redefinition of these concepts, emphasizing political control and management over economic processes. The Frankfurt School of Marxism, or Bonn State Capitalists, the Frankfurt School of Marxism, known for its focus on power dynamics, contributed significantly to the discourse on state capitalism, particularly in relation to the USSR. Friedrich Pollock, a key figure in this school, initially conceptualized state capitalism in 1941 not as applicable to the USSR, but as a progression from private capitalism's market phase to a monopoly phase exemplified by Nazi Germany. He envisioned state capitalism as a system where industrial property remained privately owned but was heavily controlled by the state, with the market being replaced by state command. Otto Kirchheimer, another Frankfurt School theorist, echoed Pollock's views, noting the preservation of private property in Nazi Germany alongside the abolition of the freedom of contract. Max Horkheimer further developed these ideas in his 1940 essay, The Authoritarian State, where he differentiated state capitalism from fascism and what he termed integral statism. For Horkheimer, State capitalism was characterized by monopolies and trusts, replacing competitive capitalist firms, and state control supplanting markets. He viewed fascism as a less extreme form of this authoritarian state, allowing some private property and thus a basis for anti-state sentiment. In contrast, integral statism, which he associated with the USSR, represented the most extreme variation, where private capitalists were eliminated and state power became virtually limitless. Korkheimer critiqued the USSR's version of state capitalism as a parody of a classless society, dominated by the oppression of the masses by the state party bureaucracy. He did not see it as socialism in the traditional sense, but rather as a stage in the evolution of exploitative society, potentially leading to a genuine socialist revolution. The Frankfurt School's interpretation of state capitalism focused less on the production and distribution of surplus labor and more on the authoritarian tendencies inherent in contemporary society viewing true socialism as far removed from the authoritarian state's misuse of collective ownership and planning. Pollock emphasized the transition from an economic to a political era with the advent of state capitalism, suggesting a shift in focus from political economy to politics or political sociology for socialists. The profit motive, he argued, was superseded by the power motive. This shift in focus to politics and power was central to the Frankfurt School's argument that the USSR represented not socialism, but a form of state capitalism, characterized by complete state control over distribution and property, and the total regimentation of social life. Kieron and Majalewski's manifesto, discussing Poland, offered a similar perspective, viewing state ownership of production means as a form of property belonging to social groups controlling the state. They highlighted the exploitation of workers through the forceful appropriation of surplus product for ends alien to their interests, framing this as a bureaucratic class system or state capitalism. In their analysis, hierarchical power leads to exploitation, with surplus production being a derivative of the social distribution of power. Buick and Crump Buick and Crump in their 1986 work present a nuanced argument that acknowledges the role of surplus labor 
yet ultimately views it as secondary to the distribution of power. They define capitalism through the presence of wages, commodity production, and a profit and accumulation orientation. In their analysis, state enterprises, by operating similarly to private capitalist enterprises in terms of wage payment, profit maximization, and market orientation, inherently exploit workers and appropriate surpluses, thus qualifying as state capitalist entities. They align with Wallerstein in the belief that any state functioning within a global capitalist economy inherently presides over a form of state capitalism due to the combined influence of the world market and the state's unique power. Ewick and Crump 1986, Wallerstein 1979. Bernard Chauvin's concept of socialist capital closely related to state capitalism, emphasizes the USSR's organization of surplus production by workers and its appropriation and distribution by the state. He argues that the Soviet system's reliance on wage labor, capital accumulation, and the disconnection of workers from real property ownership necessitates its classification as socialist capital rather than true socialism. Chavins critiques the Soviet political economy for denying these realities and calls for a systematic exploration of the capitalist organization of surplus in the USSR. Chavins, 1980. Paul Maddock brings a slightly different perspective, focusing on the unequal distribution of social power and bureaucratic status as indicators of state capitalism. He argues that the control of production means by the government rather than society at large, and the perpetuation of inequality in both production and consumption conditions maintain capitalist antagonisms within the state capitalist system. Maddock, 1969. These conceptualizations of the USSR as state capitalism share a common thread, the view that Soviet nationalization of productive property did not eradicate its fundamental capitalist class nature. This perspective challenges the pre-1917 consensus that the end of private property would signal the end of capitalism, suggesting instead that a de facto change in the social distribution of power is necessary for achieving socialism. Different theorists have elaborated on this idea in various ways. Some focus on the unequal distribution of power over the state, leading to a separation of workers from nationalized means of production, thus re-establishing capitalism in a state capitalist form. Others emphasize the lack of workers' decision-making power in production, akin to capitalist enterprise hierarchies, as evidence of state capitalism. Additionally, inequalities in income, prestige, and authority among Soviet citizens are seen as signs of a lack of workers' power, equating to state capitalism given the state ownership of property, Uick and Crump 1986. Conversely, defenders of the USSR's socialist nature often link socialism to state ownership and planning, countering the power-focused critiques of state capitalism. They argue that power in the USSR did indeed reside with the workers or their representatives, although these claims have often faced skepticism and criticism. This debate between property theorists defending the USSR as socialist and power theorists criticizing it as state capitalist remains a central theme in discussions of Soviet economic and political structure. Uick and Crump, 1986. Critics the critics of the USSR as state capitalist, largely influenced by Marxism, shared a common opposition to both state and private capitalism. Their primary critique of the USSR was its failure to transfer real social power to the workers, instead maintaining a system they identified as state capitalism. These critics, focusing on power dynamics, paralleled anti-Marxist critics of the USSR who viewed the unequal power distributions in the USSR as inherent flaws of socialism itself. These anti-Marxist critics often contrasted what they saw as the centralized, undemocratic power structures of socialism with the more decentralized and democratic structures of private capitalism. Interestingly, both anti-socialist critics and Stalinist defenders of the USSR typically avoided the concept of state capitalism preferring a binary view of private capitalism versus socialism. This avoidance created an unintended common ground between these opposing groups, a convergence that was rarely explored or acknowledged. Many socialists, 
found themselves uncomfortable aligning with either the staunch defenders or the vehement opponents of the USSR, opposed to both private capitalism and the actually existing socialism of the USSR. They were divided in their approach to defining socialism. One faction, often termed social democrats, advocated for private capitalism moderated by state controls, welfare supports, and civil liberties. The other, known as democratic socialists, supported state ownership with either worker-leased enterprises or state-operated enterprises, emphasizing democratic rights and popular participation, both within enterprises and in relation to the state. Both groups centered their arguments on the social distribution of power. Some theorists, mostly with socialist leanings, rejected the USSR as fitting into either capitalist or socialist categories. For instance, Rudolf Hilferding used a power-based argument to refute the USSR as capitalist, citing the absence of a free market, which he saw as a key feature of capitalism. However, he also did not consider the USSR socialist due to its unrestricted absolutism and specific power distribution, labeling it a totalitarian state economy. In these debates, the focus on power dynamics often overshadowed considerations of surplus labor and value, even among those well-versed in Marxian economic theories. This shift in focus led to a theoretical landscape where power was the essence, and discussions of surplus were marginalized or ignored. Weakness and problems of power theories, the power theories applied to state capitalism in the USSR, have encountered significant criticisms from various authors and researchers highlighting their conceptual and empirical weaknesses. These critiques primarily focus on the challenges in quantifying and sustaining the notion of power's social distribution. 1. Quantitative determination difficulties. Determining the distribution of power in quantitative terms has been notoriously challenging. For instance, the conventional view of Lenin's new economic policy suggested the Soviet central state's dominance over private capitalists and merchants. However, closer examination by Ball, 1990, revealed a more complex scenario, with diverse groups like Netmen, private producers, and various state and party authorities holding varying degrees of power. 2. Revisionist historical perspectives. Revisionist historians have challenged the oversimplified views of power distribution during Stalin's era. Initially perceived as Stalin's unilateral revolution from above, researchers like Fitzpatrick, 1984, Cohen, 1985, and others have uncovered a revolution from below, indicating the significant roles played by workers, intellectuals, and managers. This perspective contradicts the simplistic notion of Stalin's total power monopoly. 3. Contemporary transformations in Eastern Europe The rapid and multifaceted transformations in the USSR and Eastern European countries suggest that power distributions were always more diverse and complex than the simplistic images of an omnipotent state versus powerless masses. Kaminsky, 1991, highlighted various power-wielding groups in Poland, such as the Roman Catholic Church and Solidarity, which operated both in opposition to and independently of Communist Party and state power. 4. National and Ethnic Conflicts The intense national and ethnic conflicts in Eastern Europe have forced a recognition of the long-standing, effective power held by these groups. This contradicts the image of central authorities being unaffected by national and ethnic power dynamics. The location of industry, state spending, and access to prestigious positions have all been areas of struggle among these groups. 5. Conceptual Difficulties in Power Distribution Theories the foundational issue with social theories based on power distribution is the difficulty in specifying how social power is actually distributed. The discourse on state capitalism in the USSR often resorted to simplistic and inadequate bipolar notions of power distribution, which, while fitting Cold War rhetoric, fell short as serious analytical tools. 6. Lack of useful concepts for understanding reforms. As noted by Cohen, 1992, Sovietologists who long denied the possibility of change in the USSR's system found themselves lacking the necessary concepts to define the success or failure of reforms, especially in the context of shifting power distributions. The second major weakness in the power theories of state capitalism, as applied to the USSR, 
relates to the ambiguous definition of the term power. Stephen Luke's examination of classic definitions by various authors, including Max Weber, Bertrand Russell, Hannah Arendt, Talcott Parsons, Nikos Poulances, and Michel Foucault, reveals significant contradictions in their interpretations of power, Luke's 1986. This ambiguity is compounded by the close association of power with influence, leading to difficulties in simplistically categorizing relationships as having an absence of power on one side and its presence on the other. For instance, in the context of the USSR's state capitalism, critiques often focused on the centralized power of planning and management, portraying workers and local managers as powerless. This led to the conclusion that the USSR's economic issues stemmed from this power imbalance, and the solution was seen in decentralizing power. However, this overlooks the reality that Soviet workers and local managers did exert some form of power or influence, albeit in different capacities and contexts. A more nuanced approach would consider the specific types of local powers and their interactions with centralized state powers in shaping the USSR's economic and social dynamics. Further exploring this, if we consider the hypothetical scenario where workers are granted self-managing powers as proposed by Van Eck, 1975, the outcomes could vary significantly. Workers might choose to elect a board of directors, operating the enterprise in a manner akin to a private capitalist enterprise, viewing this as an expression of self-management and socialism. Alternatively, they might opt for a rotating board of directors, including non-workers, focusing on goals other than profit maximization. In another scenario, workers might collectively decide on all aspects of the enterprise, including the management of surplus labor, aligning more closely with the socialist framework. The key question then becomes what aspects of production the self-managing workers choose to address. Their focus might be limited to product types and production techniques, neglecting considerations like workers' health, environmental impact, or familial dynamics. Without a Marxian understanding of class in terms of surplus labor, workers' self-management might not lead to significant changes in the organization of surplus labor, from a capitalist to a communist class structure. In conclusion, the transformation to workers' self-management, or any enhancement of workers' powers, does not necessarily lead to changes in class processes, interpersonal relationships, environmental conditions, or other societal aspects. This reflects the broader argument against essentialism in social theory, emphasizing that changes in power distribution, like changes in property ownership or resource distribution systems, do not inherently produce specific social effects. Essentializing power, as often done in debates over the USSR, results in analyses that overlook the complexities and dynamics of Soviet history, particularly its class dimensions. Several authors have critiqued the lack of focus on surplus labor in analyses of the USSR and in defining the differences between capitalism, socialism, and communism. Chavins highlighted the need for such an analysis, yet it remains unfulfilled. Barry Hindus pointed out the absence of a rigorous definition of the socialist mode of appropriation of surplus labor, a sentiment echoed by Bettelheim who emphasized the importance of analyzing production relations. However, Hindus, despite his significant contributions to defining other class structures in Marxian analysis, did not develop such a definition for socialism. Bettelheim, while providing a comprehensive class analysis of the USSR, centered his approach on a power definition of class, focusing on management, discipline, cooperation, and labor organization. This approach, while shedding light on power distribution and struggles in Soviet development, overlooked the crucial aspect of surplus labor, which both he and Hindus had identified as a significant gap in Soviet analyses. Kiron and Majilevsky's work is notable for its focus on the distribution of surplus product in a Soviet-style economy particularly in Poland. However, their analysis was limited and tangential to their main concern. They overlooked the organization and appropriation of surplus labor, focusing instead on who controls the surplus product's size and distribution. This approach fails to recognize that while individuals can be identified as producers, 
appropriators, distributors, and recipients of surplus. Determining who wields power over the surplus and its distribution involves a broader range of actors, including trade unions, business associations, state officials, and others. Their work, like many others, succumbed to power essentialist theories, failing to deliver a comprehensive class analysis in terms of surplus labor. This oversight is reflective of a broader trend among analysts and participants in the Soviet experience, who, while continuously struggling over the power to determine the size and distribution of surplus labor, were not consciously aware of the specific class structures generating these surpluses. They did not contest the state capitalist form of the class structure, implicitly accepting exploitation where state ministries occupied the position of appropriators of surplus produced by others. The predominant focus among both supporters and critics of the USSR was on control over the state and production, rather than on Marx's method of disaggregating production to focus on the organization of surplus labor and its social effects. This led to a general acceptance of the state capitalist class structures in Soviet industrial enterprises without much reflection on how these structures organized the production, appropriation, and distribution of surplus labor. Consequently, most participants and observers of Soviet society overlooked class structures, focusing instead on power dynamics thereby defining class structures in terms of power rather than surplus labor. Conclusions In this age dominated by bourgeois thought, power has been the central theoretical focus. The pursuit of freedom and democracy, the hallmarks of this era, have often led to a blindness towards class, overshadowed by an overwhelming emphasis on power. This was evident in the Russian Revolution and the subsequent USSR which, despite using Marx's language, remain fixated on power as the primary object of thought and action. This fixation resulted in a neglect of class as a structure of surplus labor. Throughout the history of discussions on state capitalism and other aspects of the Soviet experience, this conceptual myopia is apparent. The fervor of the 1917 revolutionaries, their opponents, and the ideological battles of the Cold War era were predominantly centered on power. These groups, despite their differing goals, were united in their focus on understanding and transforming the distribution of power in society presuming it to be the ultimate object of theoretical and political action. In this context, Marxian class analyses were reshaped into analyses of power distribution, deviating from Marx's emphasis on surplus labor. Classes were defined almost exclusively in terms of who wielded power, whether capitalists or the propertyless masses. Anti-Marxian analyses also centered on power, often equating Marxism with a form of centralized, inefficient dictatorial statism, while contrasting it with the individualism, democracy, and economic efficiency of private capitalism. This overwhelming focus on power led to a general disregard for surplus labor. Theorists, Soviet authorities, workers, and managers alike paid little attention to it. This resulted in a theoretical and practical blindness to the persistently capitalist form of production, appropriation, and distribution of surplus labor within the USSR. It also contributed to the inability to recognize how the maintenance of a state capitalist class structure, misconceived as socialism, led to many of the USSR's deepening problems, ultimately contributing to its collapse. Later in this book aims to shift the focus from power-centric accounts to those that consider class structures and struggles in terms of surplus labor. This approach reveals how the USSR's rise, evolution, and demise were partly shaped by class dynamics absent from power-theoretic accounts. We argue that altering power distributions, while important, is not the sole solution to achieving socialism or communism. A comprehensive approach is needed, one that considers changes in power configurations alongside changes in cultural conditions and the organization of surplus labor. By constructing a class analysis of communism, capitalism, and socialism in relation to the USSR, we aim to address a critical gap in both Soviet and broader efforts to supersede capitalist exploitation. This approach adds a crucial dimension of surplus labor to our understanding of the USSR and to our visions of social change beyond capitalism. Boom! Until our narratives intertwine once more, I remain Tim. Wishing you insightful journeys. Brace for tomorrow, for with it, comes another chapter in the annals of Treeslove Peace and the Reactionaries. 
farewell until we reconvene.